Hi, I'm Sean. I'm the head gardener of the Inner Temple. Um, and I've been asked if it's possible to redo a lecture I gave as part of the Q lecture series on Monday night. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully everyone can see this. And so the lecture was called Tales of the City, Revealing London's Secret Garden. And as part of this lecture, then I'm going to give a brief history of the Inner Temple Garden. I'm then going to quickly go through my background before I started at the Inner Temple. And then I'm going to go on to our vision and the current projects we've been working at at the Inner Temple Garden. So for those that don't know the Inner Temple, then um, it is if you want to train or to practice anywhere in the UK as a barrister, then you need to be a member of one of the four inns of court and we're one of them. And um, so it's a very historic site. Um, it goes back to, and there's been lawyers here since 1312. Um, and then before that, it was a Knights Templar. Um, the site, I would say the best way for me to describe it in my mind is it reminds me of an Oxford or Cambridge college. And um, so there's a library on site, there's the church, there's the hall, and um, there's the garden and there's also residents that live on site here. Um, in terms of the garden's history, there's evidence that it's been a garden the whole time, um, but it's from 1546 that we have evidence of a head gardener on the site in our archives. Um, this picture here is much more recent history. This is 1905 um, and it depicts the main garden gates and the high borders and um, the treasury building as it was back then in the background um, and you can see the, the, the sundial just from the corner of the picture as well. In terms of the history of the garden and um, then I'm going to fast forward um, to the 17th century um, and this is a map of London and um, then and you can see the temple is here where the cursor is in the middle of the screen and if we zoom in you can see the temple is here this is a map that was before the Great Fire of London in 1666. And um, so you can see St. Paul's Church is in its form before Wren redid it. Um, and at the top of the map, there was images of landmarks of London. And in the top left hand corner was the temple. And if we zoom in, then in the 17th century, you have come straight off the River Thames into the inn and into the garden. Um, which was very formal. It was avenues of trees, mainly fruit trees and formal um, pathways laid out like this. Um, the most interesting thing I find on the history of the Inner Temple Garden is that it also tells the history of the river. Um, so the last image I showed you, the river went up to this line, this blue line, which was pre-1772. So across here, and then in 1772, land was reclaimed from the river and we gained this piece of land here where our three um, veteran plane trees are and they're still there, um, which we, we're very proud of and we do everything we can to make sure um, they will live as long as they possibly can. And then 100 years later in 70, um, 1870, then the next piece of land here was reclaimed as part of Basil Jet's embankment project and then we we got the broad walk where our avenue of plane trees is. Um, yeah. So if you um, are on the broad walk and you're looking back at the garden, then you can see um, the plane trees. This is two of the three plane trees that were planted um, after 1770 um, here. And then um, I wanted to highlight, this is the most significant moment in the garden's history in terms of how you enjoy the garden today. Um, so Sir Joseph Bazalgette created the embankment, um, as I mentioned, and so this picture painting here depicts there's a lady um, at Somerset House, and so previously um, the river would have gone up to Somerset House as well, like it used to go straight up to the garden, um, and you can see St Paul's here as it is when Wren did it, and is it as it is today, uh, and then this green area here is where the temple is. It was around this time, or just, just after this point, um, in the 1870s, where the inn um, asked famous garden designer, Robert Marnock, if he would lay out the trees um, and pathways in the garden. And then this map on the right-hand side is um, it's a modern map, 
but it shows our pathways now or as they were laid out by Robert Marnock. Um, so there's a, a pathway that goes along the outside edge of the garden around in a, in a loop. Um, and then there's trees laid out on the lawn. Um, so Robert Marnock is famous for laying out Regent's Park and also Sheffield Botanic Gardens, which the image um, at the bottom left depicts. Um, and he was famous for what's called a garden-esque style of um, garden design. Um, so this is seen as actually quite revolutionary for the time because of, um, it was all Victorian formal lines and this was seen as a move away as a quite natural. And then it was around this period, 10 years later in the 1880s, where the garden committee at the inn sought the advice of William Robinson, um, who was one of the most influential gardeners of all time. He's famous for his garden at Greystime Manor, which is pictured here, um, and also for writing the, the, the book, The Wild Garden. And the advice he gave back was that we shouldn't intervene too much with the garden, that we should allow the trees to mature to their natural form, um, and also that we should let the wild side of the garden come through, the more natural side. Um, and that's advice we still listen to today. If we jump back in the history a little bit, then the garden's always also been famous for its shows. So back in the 1850s, Samuel Broom, the head gardener then, was famous for his chrysanthemum shows. So in late summer, early autumn, people would travel across London to see the shows of chrysanthemums. And then in between 1888 and 1911, the RHS Spring Show was in the Inner Temple Garden. And this later moved to Chelsea and is what is now known as the Chelsea Flower Show. And, but before then, it was at the Inner Temple and the King and Queen would come to see the flower exhibits. And so this picture here is of George V and Queen Mary visiting the garden in May 1911. The Second World War was very significant um, in, for, for the inn and for the garden. Um, so if you can see on the left hand side, our treasury building and hall was blitzed. Um, so you can see our, our wonderful gate survived um, and the sundial, but there's all this um, brickwork and rubble here. And if we dig down in the borders, we generally do find um, rubble, um, like lots of places in London, which I, which I guess is from the, from the Second World War. And um, the bottom right hand picture, you can see the sundial here, and the remains of the building. And then the top right, you can see that the garden was used for growing veg during this time. If we fast forward to the late 20th century, then there's a succession of head gardeners that each made their mark on the garden, and uh, mainly focusing on the borders. So this watercolour on the left hand side depicts the high borders in either it's the 1970s or 1980s, and you can see it's fairly colourful. And then my predecessor, uh, many will know, was Andrea Brussendorf, and she was at the garden for 10 years, um, and she did some wonderful things with the borders, um, giving them a very much a long season and what would could be described as almost a great Dixter style, um, sometimes with clashing colours and um, yeah, a focus on a long season and form, um, which I've been very lucky to inherit. So then in 2018, um, Andrea had decided to move on to Pastures New and had accepted a job at Longwood in America. Um, and I found myself in this room here. Um, which wasn't intimidating at all. So there was an interview panel on this side and I was sat here um, and I had to give a presentation on how I would take the garden and the borders forward. So now what I thought would be interesting would be to just give a bit of an overview of what I did before the Inner Temple. Um, and for a lot of people watching the Q lecture, um, they might be starting out in their horticultural careers or training. Um, and so hopefully this, this helps anyway, but I, studied international relations and politics at the University of Sheffield and then decided on well thought after graduating maybe I'd rather be a gardener so started to pursue that instead so I was working at the time in an office and would do my RHS level two I had an allotment and was doing volunteering I applied for the RHS diploma at Wisley and also the career ship for the National Trust and didn't get on either of them um, and then had been looking for placements and Kate um sorry, Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens in Cape Town took on placements. And um, so you went and lived in the gardens and worked there. Um, and um, so I went and did a placement there for just under five months. Um, and then I came back and was looking for a job. And there was a seasonal gardener job being advertised at Testicube in Somerset, the Edwin Lutchins and Gertrude Jekyll masterpiece, um, 
So it's a really magical place if anyone gets to go. And then this is Claire, the head gardener there, who was massively influential um, at the start of my horticultural career. And I really loved um, working in that historic garden. So I was there from February through to the end of August. And then I had applied for Wisley again and was accepted this time. So started on the RHS diploma in horticulture, where you spend two years working and living and studying in the garden. Um, and my time there, um, this gentleman on the left hand side, Jim Gardner, he was the curator at the time. Um, and this is my year group graduating. And then I graduated and left for a short period and then returned as a horticulturalist. Um, and then became a team leader, managing a team of gardeners for the herbaceous ornamental team. Um, so we looked after the glasshouse landscape, which is this image in the bottom left, which is designed by Tom Stewart Smith. And um, the glasshouse borders that run up the hill from here, which was originally designed by Pete Udolf. Seven acres, we managed seven acres, um, which is where the lakes are and the winter walk. And also what was called the wild garden at the time when our oak would um, which is a woodland garden at the heart of Wisley. And I was very fortunate that the current curator of Wisley, uh, Matthew Pottage, um, he was the garden manager at the time and was my manager. And I have a lot to owe to both Jim and to Matt in terms of um, learning so much and they're uh, inspiring me to carry on in my career. Um, so thank you. Um, what I thought I'd quickly mention was that I was very fortunate um, to apply for bursaries and be accepted. And this is one of the most special things about working in horticulture that you can go to so many amazing places and meet amazing people and learn so much. So I'd highly recommend when lockdown is over for people to apply. So as a, um, I went to Trasco Abbey Gardens on an exchange, um, went out to Kyoto to spring, to spring Blossom and Ancient Gardens, joined the Alpine Garden Society on a study tour of the Peloponnese in spring. Um, and also went to New York and worked on the High Line, um, went to Chanticleer, the Botanics, um, and it was all, yeah, amazing. Um, I left Wisley and took up a, um, a new pilot position for the National Trust, which was called Gardener in Residence in my um, home city of Manchester. And the remit was to um, promote gardening and green space for the city, working not in a garden, but in collaboration with others, so one of the projects we worked on was with Manchester City Council and Land Life, um, and we converted areas of roadside verge and disused areas in the city into meadows, which this picture um, shows, which is really lovely. Um, and then it was also the centenary of the First World War um, whilst I was in this post, and I had read something about soldiers during the First World War planting snowdrops alongside war graves to remind them of home. Um, and had the idea that we should plant 100,000 snowdrops within the city centre to mark the centenary. And so different community groups and the public helped me plant all those bulbs in the city to flower that year. And then we did a collaboration with Manchester Art Gallery where we told the story of the snowdrops and we created um, bunkers with snowdrops growing out of them and um, leading people up the city um, art gallery steps and then into the foyer. Um, one of the things that I missed when I was in um, the post was having a specific garden and so I thought maybe I should try and create one in the city and so I broached to Manchester City Art Gallery if we could convert the area in front of the gallery which was um, just paved into a pop-up garden um, and they accepted and me and some volunteers created what we call the Lost Gardens of Manchester so we created um, a garden in front of the gallery where people could sit and enjoy and be surrounded by plants. Um, but inside the gallery, we also had a mini um, exhibition and installation, which told the story of lost public gardens in the city. Um, so places like the Manchester, sorry, the Royal Botanic Gardens of Manchester, which was in Old Trafford, which is now where there's a retail park, to highlight how important um, gardens and green spaces to the city and to people. Um, so whilst I was in this post, I did miss working in a garden and with a team and a plant collection. And also for personal reasons, I wanted to move to London um, and in with my partner, Tom. Um, and so when the opportunity to become the garden team manager at Kensington Palace arose, then I took that um, and we managed the gardens on the public side of the palace. And the most significant thing we did when we were there, I was there was it was the 20th 
um, anniversary since the tragic passing of Princess Diana's life um, in 2017. And there was going to be an exhibition in the palace and um, telling the princess's story through her, through her clothes. Um, and I had the idea that we should do something in the garden to connect to the exhibition. And the princess, when she lived at the palace, used to enjoy going to the sunken garden. And so we transformed the sunken garden into a white garden for that year and um, connecting to the, to the exhibition. I wasn't looking to leave Kensington Palace, um, but when I heard that Andrea was moving on and the Inner Temple had been on my radar, um, it's such a special and historic garden, but also there's so much scope for development and experimentation um, that it did really appeal. And um, so I find myself here and was fortunate enough to um, be offered the position of head gardener. So today's talk, I'm focusing on the Inner Temple Garden. We do manage some courtyards and some other areas of planting on the estate, um, but it's this area, it's um, roughly three acres. Um, if you can see my cursor, then this is where the main gates are. The high borders, which I'll talk about, are either side of the main gates. Then we've got the sundial here, We've got what we call the long border down here. Um, and then as you come round, there's the horseshoe shaped area, which is the peony garden. We have our lovely woodland edge kind of planting around here. Our lovely pot displays on our steps here. And um, the yard area is over here. So I'm just sat over here now. And then we have the broad walk running alongside the river here. And um, we have the pond garden area here and our three um, plane trees, 18, 17, 70s here, and then our hydrangea borders running up here. So one of the things that I have to do as head gardener is to do a five-year plan and five-year budget each year where we go through our aspirations and projects for the garden. Um, and so as part of that, I lay out the vision for the garden, um, which I come up with, with with the team and the masters of the garden. Um, and so the vision for the garden and um, I've put underneath there spirit of place so I was fortunate when working for the National Trust and um, to be involved with how they manage their gardens and so for each garden there would be a statement of significance which was a list of kind of historical importance and historical facts but there would also be an exercise done called spirit of place where um, we would try to come up with what the essence of that garden was and it's more a feeling um, and then that would inform all the decisions on how to take that garden forward. And that is more what the vision is about here. And um, so for me, um, so this slide here is taken from last year's five year plan. And um, it's lots of pictures of other gardens which would inspire us or kind of inform how we take it forward. And um, you can see there's Mount Stewart in the middle. And um, if anyone is in Northern Ireland in the summertime, um, you should really try to go to Mount Stewart, it's amazing. Um, but for me, the vision or the spirit of place for the inner temple garden is one of a secret garden. So I used to walk along the um, embankment. This was years ago before I knew anything about what the inner temple was. And you can see through the railings and there's gaps in between the yew hedging and um, where the trees are. And you can see into the garden. And I used to think, wow, what's that place? It looks amazing. And I used to assume because of the buildings that it was some sort of um, diplomatic building, maybe, or a government building. Um, but I always felt it was a secret, a secret garden in the heart of the city. So that's something we want to accentuate the feeling of. Um, also, we've been very lucky to inherit a, a wonderful plant collection already um, of special trees and shrubs on our herbaceous borders. But we want to accentuate that further to create a plant person's paradise, taking advantage of our special microclimate. So we um, we rarely get a hard frost, not, not usually more than say minus two. We have a very long season in the city and it's generally very hot. And um, so we can grow things at the Eden Temple that you can't even grow elsewhere in London. And then lastly, this connects to the secret garden idea, but for it to have a dreamlike quality. So the garden already has a dreamlike quality. It's very special, our borrowed views and landscape is of the River Thames, um, of Big Ben and the South Bank, the London Eye on one side and then on the other side you're overlooking this historic um, oasis in the heart of the city and we want to accentuate that feeling of dream as well as someone walks around the garden. So I've touched on this but um, I should have said at the start one of the things I think about the inn is it uh, reminds me of Harry Potter a little bit 
Um, and so um, if, if you do well um, as a member of the yin, then you'll be um, elected to become a bencher of the yin and they um, kind of guide the yin and decision-making policies for the yin. Um, and um, people will take on specific responsibilities and we call them masters, um, a masters of, so there's a master of the library, a master of the clocks, um, and there's also a master of the garden and two assistant masters of the garden. So this lady on the left hand side is Master Patricia Robertson. Um, and so she's master of the garden. Um, she's also a QC and runs um, her own iris nursery in Umbria um, and is a wonderful plant person. And we bounce ideas off each other and she helps guide me through the life of the inn um, and also to promote the garden and how special it is on the right hand side is um, our assistant master of the garden and um, judge master um, Christina Lambert and then I don't have a photo of our most recent assistant master of the garden is um, master Rosamond Hallwood Smart and um, who has a wonderful garden of her own um, and will bring a lot to the role um, and then I'm very fortunate that I mentioned Jim earlier but um, Jim Gardener is now retired but is kindly um, acting as almost an advisor to the garden so when it's not locked down he will call in and um, a few times a year and we'll walk around and talk about the ideas we have for the garden the projects and then he just shares his wealth of experience and knowledge and um, so it's really nice having that um, kind of garden friend mentor advisor role from Jim as well and I hope what comes through as well from this talk is that um, it's very much um, one of collaboration, the garden of experimentation. And I have the most wonderful team of um, talented and dedicated gardeners. So you know who I am here, but this is Emily, who's our senior gardener. And then we've got Sam in the middle, who's our trainee gardener. So one of the nice things of the inn is that its core purpose is education and training um, in law, but also that core purpose transcends down to the other teams and departments. Um, so we will have a trainee with us um, for two years um, who studies at RHS level three. And um, to Sam's right is Sophie, our deputy head gardener. And um, she's also studying for her RHS masters in horticulture alongside working in the garden. Um, and so she's currently coming to the end of that doing her dissertation on um, a comparison of street trees in London and Berlin. And then on our right hand side here, our newest member of the team, Raka, who was with us part time, you might recognise Rekka from her um, columns in Gardeners World magazine on veg gardening, um, but she's branching out into ornamentals, um, so we're very fortunate to have her on the team as well. And then we have a wonderful group of volunteers um, that join us and they bring so much to the garden as well, um, so they're not all pictured here, but um, you know who you are and thank you so much. Um, so when I started back in 2018, um, I don't know if you remember, it was the year of the beast from the east at the start of the year. And then um, like a switch, it turned in May and was very hot and very dry continuously. It was quite an extreme summer um, and it was quite a baptism of fire. I remember thinking, um, oh God, please don't let the garden die in my first summer. And it didn't, thankfully. Um, but that did make me question things. Um, what's very important to me and the team is how we garden in a sustainable manner. Um, so I've included this picture on the right hand side and it depicts um, the wonderful plants woman, Beth Chatto, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but me and my team when I was at Wisley were fortunate enough to go and visit her and her, go to her dry garden, a gravel garden in Essex. Um, and so she came up with the mantra of right plant, right plant place, and she created an experimental garden where there was no irrigation at all. So when I started, there was an irrigation system that covered mainly the lawn and was connected to mains. Um, and then we moved around sprinklers um, to keep the borders going throughout the day, um, which during a hot summer doesn't seem, doesn't seem quite right. And um, so what was going through my head and talking to the masters of the garden and chatting with the team and just me thinking about it was, you know, should we be developing the plant collection, especially places like the high borders, into an arid and um, drought tolerant planting, kind of akin to the dry garden. And what we ended up um, deciding and what I did, ended up deciding as well was that we wanted to be able to grow a wide range of plants and have the ability to water in a sustainable manner. Um, so we did already have a borehole and um, it just wasn't in use and a license to use it as well. 
Um, so one of the first things we did was have that tested. It came back that the water was garden worthy. And um, so we quickly had that um, connected to the um, irrigation system. And then each winter over the past um, three winters since I've been here, we've been extending the irrigation system around the garden and upgrading it. So now it covers the borders and we can water in a um, sustainable manner. So it's in a timer that comes on at night and it soaks the areas um, and we're not wasting water during the day and it's all coming from the borehole. So that's probably one of the most significant things we've done, projects that we've delivered since being here. And then on the left hand side, there is um, our drainage issues. Um, so when I got into gardening, I didn't think um, it wasn't because I wanted to sort out drainage issues and pathways, but um, it is really important. Um, so no one, especially if you're a, a barrister or a judge going to court, wants to wade through big puddles um, around the garden. Um, and so we put in planning applications, we put in soakaways, and we've done half the garden, and then we'll be doing the other half of the garden um, this spring. Um, I imagine lots of people have heard Fergus Garrett from Great Dixter talk about the garden there, and he talks about the bones of the garden, and they do really have wonderful bones and the structure of the garden. So I would describe things like the drainage and the irrigation as maybe the veins of the garden. Um, so to start with, now a more exciting um, topic, um, I wanted to talk to you about the high borders. So either side of the gates as you come in, they're 60 metres, just over 60 metres combined together in length. They're just under four metres wide, which isn't that wide for a uh, mixed herbaceous border. And this photo is of our deputy head gardener, Sophie, and she manages the high borders. So how fabulous they look, um, the credit needs to go mainly to, to Sophie. Um, I've included, um, I was meant to say at the start here, I've included some videos within the talk. Um, I think they should work on this platform. If they don't, then um, there's backup slides with photographs after this, so just don't worry. But um, I'm going to now share a video of the high border that was taken last, um, it was towards the end of May. Um, and you can see from this still, we've got our wonderful um, Rosa Mutabilis, which flowers for us pretty much every day of the year. And then the big umbels next to it is black parsley, melisalinum. Um, but I'm going to press play now and you can see um, all the nice things, um, such as the frothy um, Hesperus, the sweet rocket, the Arundo, um, the fennel, um, the Echiums, the alliums, the fox gloves, that's Camelot lavender, things like the ornamental grasses coming out. Um, this, I'll touch on in a moment, this is Euphorbia serrata stigma, uh, sorry, serrata carpa, um, which is amazing. It flowers from May through till um, to November. We've got the nice cardoons with the silver. Um, it was so nice when you're in February to look at the garden in May and know it's coming. And then if we look out, you can see our lovely Arbutus mnesii tree and those alliums are universe, I think. And you can see that's one of the planes from the 1770s in the distance. And then on this side, you can see nice things like the thistle on a podium. Um, and I think that's Allium schubertii and the geraniums. Um, and the tall allium is allium summer drummer so that's not out yet but this, the, the structure is nice and then this is echium candy cans where we've just stopped and so the cold weather we had a couple of weeks ago really knocked this echium candy cans we did put fleece around it but i'm still slightly concerned that it definitely won't flower this year um, and i hope we haven't lost it but let's see so here's some stills from the high borders you can see the wonderful rosa and Banksia lutea on the railings in the top left hand corner and the Euphorbia serratocarpa is what I mentioned before, does this lovely spilly thing, the limey green, a really long season of flower, I would highly recommend it. Um, and the Hesperus is the purple matronalis sweet rocket um, and the white form of it as well. Um, Foxgloves digitalis are a kind of a key moment for us across the garden, not just in the high borders. So across the whole garden, last autumn, we planted out just under a thousand um, digitalis in different varieties. So we always use these favourites um, and then we usually try out a couple of different ones as well. And so we've got Camelot Lavender, Camelot Cream, which comes up early and then 
um, things like soot and apricot, which comes up slightly later. Um, I include this picture now because um, I try to dine out on when I met the princes as often as I can. Um, and I'm being quite subtle today because of um, you can't see my face, I'm behind this umbrella here. Um, but I'm mainly including it to give you a sense of the type of gardening that I enjoy. Um, so the white garden, the sunken garden, has this wonderful structure. So you, there's these windows on the outside, which frames views as you look into the garden. And then it's a very formal layout um, with the long um, beds. And then, but what I enjoy is for the planting then to be um, dreamlike and exuberant. And you've got the wonderful things like the panicum grasses and the gaura and cosmos cupcakes mixed in with it and things like the agrostis. And then this short video, if you were looking through this window here, then you would have seen this. Um, and so you can see there wasn't just white within the garden, there was accents of soft pink and silvers, and um, that's Malva Machata. Um, and I really enjoy things that have movement in the wind um, and create atmosphere. So back to the high borders now, um, and you can see this photo is taken in, I think it's mid to late July. Um, and what we want to achieve with high borders is a real sense of wow and drama as you come into the garden. And that's achieved a lot through the height of the borders. So we've got things like the Rubecchia herbston, the um, Miscanthus giganteus, um, this is the tree dahlia, the Arundo, so things that get up to eight, 10 feet high. And um, so it creates a little drama as you come into the borders. And then we like things that spill forward, um, such as the Heliopsis and the Euphorbia, I already mentioned. Um, which gives us an extra meter or so of border at that time of year um, and a real sense of kind of um, energy. So some of the things that um, I absolutely love by the high borders, there's things like I mentioned the tree dahlia, so dahlia imperialis. Um, I've worked, where I've worked in other gardens, we've grown the tree dahlias just for foliage alone, so they'll get up to, like I said, eight feet high and look a bit like bamboo um, and quite dramatic. But here we have long enough season that we will generally get the flowers in late November, which are these large um, daisy pink flowers. And um, because of the lockdown last summer, um, it was just me on my own in the garden for the first month. And then the team kind of slowly came back. We didn't do our large dinner plate dahlias, so things like Otto Skrill and Emery Paul. Um, and we did really miss them. And luckily, things like the salvias really carried the show for us. Um, but the dinner plate dahlias will be back with a vengeance this year um, and Sophie's going to mix in a couple of different varieties as well. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. One of the projects we've currently been working on um, is this border that runs alongside paper buildings. It is west facing and um, it's had various names throughout the years. We used to call it the War of the Roses border and um, within the archives and old maps it's referred to as a long border and we started calling it the Long Border again. And this is a project that Emily has been leading on. Um, and you can see her and our trainee, Sam, um, doing the clearing work. And um, so when I took over the garden, there was a series of hedges running along down the border, dividing it up. Um, and then a, a quite lovely um, kind of spring bedding display. And then a summer bedding dis display was planted out each year um, in between the compartments. Um, um, but it just felt like there's an opportunity here for us to grow uh, more interesting plants that make the most of our microclimate and create um, a, a just a, a, an exciting border. Um, so we've cleared and we're, we're starting almost afresh. And to start the, the display, we planted, um, it's around 3,000 allium bulbs to come up this May. Um, so lots of our favourites that we've grown elsewhere in the garden, but they'll all be in one place and in mass. It should look amazing. Um, and we've got them mixed in with herbaceous perennials. And we want the long border to sit um, nicely and cohesively with the high border, but have its own distinct character. So where we have things like the dahlias in the long border, we won't be using any dinner plate dahlias. We'll just be using things such as these um, kind of cute star shaped like honka and um, pom poms like Ivorona. Um, and we do have tree dahlias down there as well, but um, a more fine variety excelsa. 
Um, Emily's also selected some really nice herbaceous material, um, such as Canna Cross Sea Manii, which some of you might know from the Garden Museum, where it looks wonderful, um, and things like um, Glycorrhiza unionensis in the middle, which is mainly for its seed heads. And we absolutely love seed heads in the garden later in the season, um, but I don't talk about them too much in this um, talk because I don't have time. And likewise, um, ornamental grasses are one of my all time favourite things. They really are the backbone of the garden and create the atmosphere. Um, so we have them across the whole garden and they'll be included in this border, um, but I'm not going to focus on them here. And then also certain things like the species roses, Rosa dramium, she's included. Um, so it's really exciting. One of the things that we wanted was how the garden all sits together and also to become more, um, as well as being a haven for people, a haven for wildlife. Um, and one of the things we've done is as you come through the gates and you've got the high borders, now um, we've extended our areas of meadow. So the meadow comes up the slope and meets you. Um, and we used to have formal um, rose beds sat within the lawn. Um, and now we just have large shrub roses sat within meadow areas which is also taking the advice of Lillian Robinson. Um, and then this video here, it's not anything unusual, but there's nothing more beautiful than cow parsley um, in the wind in May time. And um, so it means that we've got this, this ambience in the garden. And importantly, it has also meant that we've been able to extend the season. So I had in my mind when I was at Wisley, um, Jim Gardner would always say a garden for 365 days of the year. Every day that you go to Wisley, there'll be something spectacular to see, and there is. Um, and so we've been wanting to extend the season from May time. The garden is absolutely fabulous. And um, before then, there's lots of lovely things, but we can build on it. So having these meadow areas have allowed us to um, start creating these big carpets of early flowering and um, spring bulb flowers. And um, so we've been planting thousands of just common snowdrop and things like the species tulips, Tulipa sylvestris turkestanica. We've tried things like the mini irises. Pauline didn't particularly like the snow, uh, but Iris Catherine Hodgkin um, is loving the meadow at the moment in the sun. Um, and then some more kind of delicate narcissi. And um, so this is going to take a number of years to build up the rich tapestry that we are after. Um, but it's starting to show how it could feel. So I've already touched on one of the things that I particularly like about gardening is this idea of structure, but softness of planting, a focus on plants, and but also on people and how they enjoy the garden and the feeling of welcome. Um, so this also kind of relates back to when I was at Hestercombe. So Edwin Lutchins laid out the amazing formality and stonework of the garden. And then if you're talking to Claire, she would say how Gertrude Jekyll came along and she smothered that structure with a layer of flowers and foliage. Um, and then there's also lovely things such as the framed views out to the Somerset countryside. So here, I mean, it's quite a, um, a small thing we've done, but we've got a wonderful gate, but we've added the vine um, here, which is Vitus cognetii, and it has really beautiful autumn colour as well. Um, and Sophie's grown from seed, Cobea scandens, and um, this purple flower here, which is usually a half hardy annual, but um, we're mild enough that it survives the winter. And so we have a very long season of flowers and it's, it's really wonderful. And they grow together really nicely. And then we already had the Clematis Lampton Park and the nice seed heads. But this creates this sense of welcome. It also frames the views of the garden and the feeling of secret garden as you come in. And then also we like to create moments um, for different seasons. So such as um, decorating the garden gates for Christmas with all our nice seed heads. Um, on the other side of the garden, one of the key structures is the Broadwalk. So we've got our magnificent avenue of plane trees. Um, so this reminds me of something from Paris or um, Game of Thrones. And it's been really lovely um, modelled the scale by this is my niece and nephew. Um, but you can see um, how wonderful this is. And we've got this understory um, of ground cover, which is Lirio muscarii, which can grow in really dry and shady conditions. And so when you're on the broad walk, you're looking out across London. And um, so you're looking at the London Eye and Big Ben, and you're looking west at this point. So you're getting sunset. And then when you look back over the garden, then you've got a wide expanse, uh, this feeling of oasis. Um, but we wanted to accentuate the feelings of structure in this part of the garden. And um, so we've added 
some, um, it's young at this stage and it hasn't established. And um, this is just some yew hedging at each end of the broad walk. So it creates this, um, it encourages the vista view. Um, but also it means we won't let it get too high. So you'll be able to see over the top. But as you come past the hedge, then the full opening, the wide view will be accentuated. Um, and then we cut back things like the liriope here to try to establish other plants through it which means that we've been able to create moments like this. So this was last May, and this is the white sweet rocket, Hesperus matronalis alba, um, which is planted through the Liriope. And so one of the things of the garden is that it's almost one picture. Most places you are in the garden, you can see a lot of the rest of the garden. Um, so it all needs to have a link and a unity, though we want areas to have their distinct characters as well. Um, so this is really nice and we're, we, we, we're developing um, kind of other key moments through here. So we've, we've added things like Japanese and enemies, John Horain Hobart, uh, Honorine Jobert, um, for a late season down here as well. And we're gonna keep experimenting here over the coming years. We've also been focusing on other entrances to the garden. So there's a side entrance at, um, for members and residents, the people that live in the garden. Um, at King's, sorry, this is at Middle Temple Lane, and this leads up onto the broad walk here. We want to create a sensory shift as you come into the garden. And um, so we've added things like the tree ferns, the dixonias, and um, the standard bays, the stone pots with ferns in them. And then we can add things like the hyacinths, which are quite old fashioned. I absolutely love for early season interest and scents. Um, and then nice things like echiums. Um, and then as you come, in from King's Bench Walk. Uh, we've taken the lead from the trees within that area. So there's a really gorgeous version of a, a Magnolia Crossulangiana, which has these nice pink flowers. And there's also a Prunus sargentii with its soft pink blossom. So then we're planting bulbs that will come out and complement those colors at the same time. So there's things like the hyacinth and um, China pink in this large planter. Tulipa, sorry, Tulipa um, Apricot Beauty, which is one of our favorites, it's a classic. Um, but this is early and then it flowers for almost a couple of months in a slightly shaded area here, which it's happy with. Um, and then our favourite miniature Narcissi, Caniculatus, which we absolutely love. It's really cute. We've been lucky to inherit some wonderful planting as well. So over in the Peony Garden, um, we have our Bisteria, which dates to 1848. Um, and we have our wonderful tree peonies, which we're not sure when they date to. Um, but what we've been doing here is just creating a little alcove within the bed where we can add a seat so someone can sit underneath the wisteria and amongst the tree peonies and enjoy them. Um, and we've done the same on the opposite side where the wisteria spills over here. We've created an alcove with a bench, which is being uh, nicely modelled here by our master treasurer. And then also we've been um, analysing the garden um, and wanting to create balance. And um, what we noticed was that most of the interest and the laid planting was all on the east side of the garden. And as people came around to the west side of the garden, there's our lovely hydrangeas, but not much else. And you notice actually people kind of sped up as they were walking down here because there's less to take in. And so to create balance of the garden, we've created this large bed connecting the tree circles. And um, so this is me using the turf cutter and we, we lifted all this. This was last, not last autumn, the autumn before. And then in its first summer, this was last summer during lockdown. And um, we've got this nice large bed now to create a depth of planting on this side of the garden. And it's meant we've got opportunity to plant lots of gorgeous things. We've planted things like snake bark maples, like Acer Davidii Viper and George Forrest. Um, we've got gorgeous things like um, this cloudy grass, just Tamsia Gold Town, and um, some nice woodlandy things like Boscoas. Um, and then we also left gaps and put in annuals last year, partly because of lockdown, but also um, there's key things we know we want, and then but you're never quite sure on the character of an area. Um, and it's good to have things which are you can just experiment with and then see if they're right or wrong before you commit to certain things like perennials or completely fill the bed, um, and that worked really well. So the most significant project, or potentially the most significant project that we've worked on was last autumn, and this has been developed over a couple of years, and it's the pond garden. Um, so we identified that the pond area was the area of the garden that could be most improved. Um, so I, take, I, do, I do admit this is a particularly bad, horrible photograph of how the pond used to be. 
we did use to kind of hide it in lots of pots and it did look quite lovely between spring and summer and when they were all out um, but you can see from this picture you know there's a stone sorry um bricks around the boy is connected statue is connected to the pond so you can do a full circle there's paving and um, it was a bit of a small little kind of um area within the garden um, so we started playing around to see what we could do to improve it so I think this was me and Sophie one day um, and we doubled the size of the area so that we could have beds and started playing around with plants just to get a feel and if we had a pathway going in how that would be and if you were in the area where you would want to sit and that kind of thing and then we looked for inspiration so this is Tom Stewart Smith Garden this is Shanty Clear the Jardin du Montpissac down here. Um, and then we worked with the garden company who drew up the design for us um, and also did the hard landscaping when it was approved internally. So you can see from this design here, we've doubled the area surrounding the pond, um, which has allowed us to have these beds with planting in the ground. Um, we have the boy has been relocated the statue into the planting bed here so you can do a full circle around the pond the pond surround has been made thinner and has been changed to portland stone to match the gates and the sundial um, and then we have the seating area so a large seating area here where you can sit a group of people and some different size seating areas here so we found that a lot of people are drawn to water so it's nice for it to be a really sociable area of the garden and then the dark green here is yew hedging which we're going to allow to knit together into low organic cloud shaped mounds so when you're sat in the areas you feel enclosed but as you stand up you can get wide views across the garden um, and then we have some lovely multi-stemmed cherry trees so this is work commencing last autumn and um, so you can see it here and then you can see it being dismantled and the air being landscaped and the topsoil coming in and then this picture here on the bottom left and um, you can see the new scale of the garden in relation to the wider garden um, which is more in proportion and then you can see the portland stone surround being installed on the bottom right then more excitingly me and the team we did the planting so this is the Prunus cross Eodensis and Prunus incise for the bride coming and Sam driving them down to the area and then all the volunteers helping us plant um, those trees. And then us planting the yew hedging. So this is Rekka doing her shuffle um, to make sure they're firmed in. And then the herbaceous understory planting as well and you can see so there's things like prunus and size of the bride there's a really gorgeous specimen a wisley which we took the inspiration from on seven acres um, and we've planted we've dotted a couple of these um trees elsewhere in the garden to pick up on the whole picture so it's not just one thing happening at the pond area we've got things in the pond like the lotus flower and um, so this was jim garner's idea and so we're trying this in spring we should have a long and hot enough summer that we should get lotus flowers if we grow them in the pond which would be very special we've got some really lovely ferns and more unusual um herbaceous plants in like the main manthamans and um, so we're really excited about seeing it um, all come up this first year and this is the garden finished as it is now so we need to let the yew knit together and then create the nice cloud shaped mounds and um, that won't be too high we've got the nice thinner um surround in portland stone which now sits within the wider landscape much nicer the boy is now within the bed we've got our nice multi-stem cherry trees and our our seating alcove set within set within and then a slightly more close-up view so if you're sat in this nice sociable seating area here you're looking west so you're getting sunset and those views over to big ben and um, across the water and until the water lilies and water lotus grow we've got lovely um reflections within the water and then this is looking outwards towards the river from there and if you're sat then you get this nice uh, um, sound of water onto the onto the onto the pond and as i say our wonderful borrowed landscaping views across london 
So I hope what's come across as well is what's really important to us um, on our vision for the garden is how we engage and share the garden with others. Um, so we've got a really active Instagram account. Um, if you're on Instagram, please sign up and then follow us. And if you're not, I think you can still just log in and look, and look at what we're doing on a computer. Um, it's about how people enjoy the garden and how we share it. So we've started kind of um, highlighting plants within the garden on a nice little specimens table. We do our plant of interest board and the Interfaith Forum have been helping us do tree planting. Um, and in the summer, we add things like um, a few deck chairs so people can chase the sun or the shade um, as they wish. Um, Usually when it's not locked down, we are open to the public between half 12 till 3 p.m. Monday to Friday. And we also have open days um, during the summer. And so check out our Instagram and our website for those um, if you're not a member or, or a resident. And so I hope what's also come across is that it's not just me. Um, we're all the custodians, so the Masters of the Garden, myself, the team, the volunteers, Jim, of this um, very special and historic garden. And what we're trying to do is to develop it um, in, a, in a sensitive manner that we can pass it on to future generations to enjoy um, as, as, as we are now. And last but not least, just to finish, um, if I haven't convinced you to come and see the garden because of the horticulture, um, you should come and meet our beautiful garden cat. This is Patsy. So when she's not looking after the echium seedlings in the glass house, you may find her on the garden steps um, and she would love to say hello also. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that lecture for those who couldn't attend it live um, through Q on Monday. And um, yeah, I hope you come to the garden and enjoy it. Okay, so thanks a lot. Bye.